What a blessing it is to be here this morning as we've gathered together as God's family to love him, to serve him, to glorify his holy and magnificent name. It is so awesome when we get to gather together as God's people to be able to not only encourage one another, but to uplift each other, to be able to fellowship with one another and to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. If you're visiting with us, you are our honored guest and we encourage you, please stay after a little bit so that way we can get to know you. You can get to know us better as well. Also in the pews in front of you, there are visitor cards. And if you want this time, take some time to fill those out. And when the collection plate comes around, you can drop those in there. So that way we have a record of your attendance. I want to say something before we begin. Uh, as you notice, we're missing somebody today and he's down in Texas, just as was said earlier. And even though he's not here with us this morning, we know that he's still our family, right? Amen. That was our intern, Cody Kilgore. He was here. Uh, he moved in a year ago. And it's so crazy how time flies by, right? And yet, man, if you, got to, if you got to experience not only how much he grew, but as well as how much spiritually we grew because of the blessing that he was in our lives, man, it's just been an awesome year. And one of the things I just wanted to say to the congregation is not only are we thankful of the blessing that he was in our lives, let me tell you something. This congregation, I want to thank you for the blessing that you were in his life. The reason why I brought him, the reason why I encouraged him to come here, and the reason why we, we said let's bring a young man up here to Elgin, Illinois to learn is because this is an awesome congregation. And I couldn't imagine starting my first year in ministry after graduating from preaching school and getting to spend a time like that he did with a congregation like this. What a blessing it is, amen? What a blessing it was. And Lord willing, we know that if we never, if we, we, we hope to see him again, right? That's the plan. We hope to see him again. But if we don't see him within this life, we have hope for the next. And that's the blessing about being a Christian. And that's actually what we're going to be talking about this morning. The hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We've been going through a series entitled The Church on the Foundation. And the reason why we've been going through that series is because as Christians, when you become a Christian, just the way Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 tells us, you're added to the church, right? You're added to the church. The Lord gives the increase. You're those who become part of God's family. And as the church, because you can't have Christianity apart from the church. Uh, Paul refutes that in the book of Ephesians, from Ephesians chapter 1 all the way through chapter 4. He says that's the mystery of the gospel, not only because you and I have been saved, but we've been joined together back to God. You can't be a Christian apart from God's people. But you know what the blessing about being the church is? Is that we have this awesome book in which you and I can go back to and help us to become like the church Jesus died for, right? See, we've been saying this, and I know it may sound redundant, but I want us to continue to emphatically believe this. We're not trying to be a new kind of church. We're not trying to be a different kind of church. We're trying to be the church that Jesus Christ died for. We're trying to be the church that we read in the New Testament, the church that we read of in the Bible. We want to worship like the way they worshiped, right? We want to teach the things they taught. We want to love like the way they did. And you know what? We have the same hope that they had. If you're in Christ, you have a hope that surpasses all things. And Peter talks about that. I want to thank Zach for reading, to, uh, reading that passage to us this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want us to look at this idea of hope in 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. And as we look at this hope, I want to take note of our first point this morning. We have hope because of his mercy. Let's read this together, shall we? 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. And he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to stop there. Notice how he begins this section. He wants them to emphatically, just like the way he is, he's saying every single person who's reading this, every single person who's going to be reading this for the next generation of Christians, blessed be the Lord our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That idea of bless implies doxology, implies praise. Praise him. And what is he praising him for? He says, according to his great mercy. What exactly is the mercy of God? See, God in his compassion, he has compassion to not give us what we deserve. What exactly do we deserve? You know, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. First John would describe, John would describe in first John that sin is the transgression of the law. In other words, you transgress God's covenant. You transgress who God is in his nature. Romans chapter six and verse 23 says, this is what we deserve because of sin. We deserve 
death. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how does God then show us his mercy? He shows it to us in his son. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 even says, Peter says, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is what Peter is praising God for, and he wants you to praise him for as well. He says, let us praise God according to his great mercy. I love that, Gerald. Gerald, I don't know if you planned this, but the song that we sang before the sermon, he's like, yeah, of course I did. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 through 23. That's a passage that I wanted to look at this morning in coinciding with this verse. That's what that song is. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, you know how he describes God there? He says he's a father of mercy. Rather, he is the father of mercy. You know what that means? Mercy began with him. That's how amazing God is, amen? amen. God of mercy. Why should, I don't, this is the thing that Peter is wanting for them to understand. Why should we praise God? Because, oh, he is rich in mercy. See, let me tell you something. Unless we have some sort of sensory deprivation, there is no reason for us to not look around in our lives and see how merciful God is, right? There's no excuse. If you're a Christian, this is what Peter's saying. He's like, open up your eyes. Have you forgotten the mercy of God that the reason why you can call yourself Christian, the reason why you can even call him, remember he opens up, blessed be the God, our Father. You know what John in John chapter 1 and verse 12 says? To those who received him, he gave the right to be called children of God. Not according to the will of men, but according to the will of God. In other words, it was always God's intention to call you his child. It was always God's intention to show you mercy. Before the foundation of the world even came into existence, God desired mercy for you. And that's why he should be praised. And that's what gives us hope. He continues on and he describes what this, what this mercy caused. He says, according to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Caused us to do what? Caused us to be what? Caused us to be born again. What does this mean to be born again? You know, you think about the apostles. When Jesus died, in their limited perception, they lost hope, right? They were like, well, I guess that's it. They're like, he, he's dead. Our, our master, our Messiah that we followed for three years is gone. He's dead and there is no hope. Many of them went back to their former occupations, right? As though, well, I guess things go back to the way they were. And then they saw the resurrected Savior. Peter, if there's anybody who understands the mercy of God and being born again, having that hope revived again, remember Peter denied Jesus three times before his death? And then he knew that Jesus was crucified, died brutally. Their whole lives, they, they knew what crucifixion was all about. Nobody comes back from crucifixion except for Jesus. You don't think Peter, seeing that, realizing there is hope. There's hope for me. And think about all of us as Christians. Peter would later on in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23 would say, we've been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable seed. We as Christians have all been born again. If you're in Christ, you're born again, right? And that's the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 through 19, he would remind us that there is hope in the resurrection because if Jesus was able to resurrect from the dead, you and I are able to walk in newness of life as well. There is hope in the resurrection. I love what Paul said in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5, Paul would say, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in the trespasses of our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Remember that beginning of that passage. But God, who is what in mercy? Who is rich? And because of such, you and I have hope. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, I love what Paul here writes. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there is hope because of mercy. There is no hope without rebirth. I want us to understand that. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. He says, unless you become born again, he says, unless you are born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, right? 
And he even reminds me, he's like, he's like, this is what I'm saying. He's like, you heard me say, one must be born again. There is no hope without rebirth because I can't have hope while still living as the way Paul Delgado, that's me, before Christ, who was lost, who was undefiled, or rather who was unclean, who was impure. See, you and I can't disassociate that one must be born again to experience what Peter is talking about here. The possibility that people can be reborn through Christ is amazing. And it's all because of God's mercy. We have hope because of his great mercy. Praise God. Why can we have hope? Why does hope even exist? Because of a merciful, loving God. But what else comes with the hope of God? What else can we understand hope better with? See, uh, verse 4 will help us understand that hope we have. We have hope because of our inheritance. Let's go ahead and look at verse 4, what Peter says. Now, remember, earlier on, he says, We've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. What does this idea of inheritance imply? You know what it implies? Inheritance, in the Greek word here, implies land given to an heir. Property given to an heir. So what does that make us if we have an inheritance? If you're a Christian, remember, he's talking to Christians here. What does that make us then? That makes us heirs. Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 says, We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, he says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to his promise. You and I are heirs. But do we inherit some sort of physical property? Oh no, this is what he says. He says, this is what our inheritance is. He says, we have an inheritance that is imperishable. You know what that word imperishable means? It means eternal. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 through 18. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 through 18, this is what Paul says. The context of the book of 2 Corinthians is to instill hope. A lot of times, uh, Cody uh, one time made mention of this, uh, his instructor, one of his instructors at school said, he said a lot of times we spend so much time focusing on 1 Corinthians, but you know what one of the most neglected books in the New Testament is? 2 Corinthians. And yet it's a book that oftentimes we need to read because a lot of us lose heart in this life, right? And that book is all about hope. That book is all about the thing in which God has promised us, that inheritance. And Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, he says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self, our physical being, is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed daily. For this light, this is how he describes life. He says, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient. In other words, this physical life, even the, even the suffering that comes with it, maybe the, Paul specifically earlier in this context talks about his own physical sufferings. How, and later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28, the physical sufferings he would go through, you know what he describes them? He says they're transient. In other words, they're going to pass. But the things that are unseen, they're eternal. In other words, the things that God has waiting for you, that's eternal. He describes Peter, going back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, he describes that inheritance as imperishable, eternal. But you know how else he describes it? He says it's undefiled. You know what that word undefiled means? It means it can't be stained. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 25 says, Nothing unclean will ever enter into that land of inheritance. That's assurance, isn't it? That's hope. He also describes that inheritance as unfading. This idea of unfading implies never losing its beauty and never growing old. And that inheritance is kept in heaven. The word here, kept, is a military word which means reserved or protected. It's like a garrison surrounding a city from an oncoming invasion, except this particular protection that we have is 100%. It's 100% safe. This, uh, this garrison that we have protecting us, God himself cannot be defeated. And that home that we have in heaven, that inheritance that is ours, can never be corrupted. He says it's unfading, kept in heaven for whom? For you. Here's the thing. Sin may have ravaged the garden. Sin may have ravaged Israel. But sin will never ravage that inheritance that you and I have. Amen? Sin can never do that. When we look at this hope because of our inheritance, Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 6, you remember Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, Jesus would even say, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, right? 
where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, lay up for yourself treasures where? In heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love what Paul wrote in, uh, when we look at the New Testament, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in that context, Paul is dealing with the resurrection because for some reason in the days of the New Testament, in the first century, a lot of the writers are going to deal with this, especially Paul. There was a denial that the resurrection ever happened. Remember how last week we looked at, uh, at 1 John and they were denying there, there couldn't have been a resurrection because Jesus never could have come in the flesh and so on and so forth. Here's the thing that Paul rebukes. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if the resurrection never happened, you and I are miserable. But you know what else he says? Because of the resurrection, we have hope that you and I, that this is not our final home. That you and I not only can walk in newness of life, but that you and I Aren't going to be that way. I love what he says in verse 19. He says there in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19, he says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, in other words, if all there is to this life is just what we see here and there's nothing beyond this, then there is no hope. I love that he says that because Paul, without, without a shadow of a doubt, says there is hope beyond this life. There is something more than just what we see before us. That is assurance. That is hope. Now, let me say, let me, let me, you know, we look back at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, and verse 20. Jesus is giving his disciples the great commission. He tells them to go, therefore, into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why is that so important? Why did Jesus want his disciples to teach people this? Because baptism, along with obedience, along with repentance, along with all those other things, is essential for salvation. And he says, before I go into heaven, I want you to teach people this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always. That's what I want to emphasize. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. His promise that he will always be with his people, that promise that he's going to prepare a place, man, God has ensured that his people will not only, we're going to look at this in a little bit, not only will his people be protected, but their inheritance also is protected. See, the idea of inheritance is nothing new in the New Testament, or nothing new in the scriptures, right? You think about the children of Israel. They had an inheritance, right? And that inheritance was the land of Canaan. And they would go into that land and inherit it. But Christian inheritance is greater. Why? Because the inheritance of the Christian is God himself and everything he provides. You want me to tell you what the greatest thing about heaven is? The greatest thing about heaven is not, you know, we oftentimes, you know, we sing songs, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. We sing songs about streets paved with gold. That's awesome. And we know that those are, you know, descriptive of just saying, this is how, heaven's going to be amazing. But you know what makes heaven great? It's the fact that God is there. And the fact that we get to dwell in his presence for eternity. What could be far greater than that? heaven, man. Heaven, I, you know, we look at, there are so many passages that we can see in scripture that just tell us how awesome heaven is. Israel, like we said earlier, was the promised land to the Israelites. Israel is a temporary promised land, and yet Israel's landscape has changed so many ways in the last 2,000 years, but our inheritance will never fade away, and our inheritance will never change. Let me tell you, the prettiest flower in all of Palestine eventually will die, but there is nothing about heaven that'll ever pass or fade away. Isn't that assurance? That is hope. See, this world and all in it will eventually fade away, but we know our home with, a, excuse me, our home in heaven with merciful God will never. And Satan, if your strength is in the Lord, he can never take that away from you. That's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8, towards the very conclusion. I want to look at our third point this morning as we look at this passage. Our third point, when we think about the hope that we have in verse 5 says we, we know that we have hope of our protection until that day. In verse 5, he says, who, now I want us to understand, who's he still talking about here? Earlier, he talks about those who've been born again. He says those who have an inheritance. He's continuing that same thought with the same people. This who here is Christians. He says Christians by power, God's, excuse me, by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That word guarded there is a military term. It's another military term, which means protected. It means made safe. And that's what God does for us until that day that we receive that inheritance. When we think about what he's saying here, when we think about while our inheritance is being guarded in heaven, we're being protected right now by 
his care. That's assurance that you have as a church, amen? That is assurance. As I said earlier, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, Jesus told the disciples, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Let me ask you a question. Was that promise just to the 12? Was that promise just to them? Or is that promise extended to everyone who calls him Lord? Everyone who calls him Lord and does the things that he says. Because remember, Jesus himself says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So the disciples of Jesus, if you're a Christian, and if you are doing everything you can to live according to his will, you have that assurance as well, that he will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Is that a promise to all of us? Absolutely. Despite discouragement, despite suffering, trials, and temptation, Paul would say to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Whose power? Peter says in this passage in verse 5, God's power. Paul would say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me what? Who gives me strength. Paul described the gospel as power and his hope and the fact that he has no reason to be ashamed there in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul would say, The Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you from the evil one. I love what Paul wrote at the very end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18. He says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That was Paul's assurance, even in the midst of his suffering. Paul's writing uh, 2 Timothy, his very last letter that he wrote from prison. And he knows, I'm not getting out of here. I know I'm going to die. Uh, history would tell us that Paul was, Paul was beheaded by Nero, uh, the Roman emperor, under the orders of Nero, rather. And yet Paul didn't see his life as, if you look at the life of Paul on the surface, you're like, wow, that ended tragically. Paul saw his life ending triumphantly because he knew of the home that he had in heaven. He knew the hope that he had. And even in the midst of while he's waiting his execution, he's saying, I'm still made strong right now. My hope isn't just somewhere far off. He says, my hope is right here, right now, because he protects me. Amen? And you have that same assurance if you're in Christ. See, the early church, like we should believe they were living in the last hour, the final period, the Christian age, starting when the gospel was preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. And in the midst of all this time, many Christians had suffered greatly for the name of Christ, whether in the first century and some of our brethren in the 21st century. What helps them and what helped them to press on? What was their hope? God would secure them and their inheritance no matter what the world throws at them. Let me tell you, if you're a member of the body of Christ, if you're a member of the church, you have that hope. I don't know what every single person in this auditorium is going through right now. I know somebody who does. That's God Almighty. He knows your hurt. He knows your pain. He knows your weaknesses. He knows the trials you've gone through. He knows the triumphs you've had. He knows the tragedies that you are facing or that you have faced or will face. But he knows another thing that he wants you to understand without a doubt. That if you put your faith in him, he will protect you. He will provide you the strength you need to carry on. That he will be with you. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let me tell you, God is true to his promises, right? God keeps his promises. I tell you, that doesn't mean that life is going to be, that doesn't mean that these things, that the, that the troubles of life are going to escape us. And they're not, absolutely not. But just as the way he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, he will provide a way of escape from those things. You may have to go through those things, but he'll provide a way to help you through it. Let me tell you, God doesn't desire to make, God doesn't desire to make your life easier. You know what he desires? For you to use his strength to make you stronger, to endure, to overcome to be victorious with him. And the only way we can do that is with God's power, right? Let me tell you, there's so many people that if you talk with that are in Christ that have gone through some hard things that I can never imagine. And you know how what they always, you know, I've met brethren, man, to, even towards the end of their lives where they will say, I'm here by the grace of God. I'm here because of his strength. Isn't that what, what, what Jesus told Paul? My grace is sufficient for you. And to Paul, he says, well, then that's all I need. Paul, you know, Paul prayed three times in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He had this thorn in his flesh that he wanted to be removed. We don't know exactly what that might have been, you know, that thorn in the flesh. Uh, it wasn't a literal thorn. I, 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 I'm pretty sure of that. But he's talking there. He's saying something difficult in my life is taking place. And for Paul, who is far stronger than I am, to say, I want this gone, Lord. It must have been so hard. 
It must have been so heavy for him. It must have been a burden that he felt, I don't know how I can go on if this thing's going to remain in my life. He prayed to God three times. What did Jesus tell him? Jesus says, no, because my grace is sufficient for you. Does Paul say, well, you know what? Then forget it. I'm done with Christianity. I'm moving on. God, I prayed to you. You didn't know. He said, well, then by this, I will rejoice. Because in his mind, he's saying, if that's all I needed, then I can endure. Because I've got God's strength and his protection. You look through history, there's a book that you can pick up, uh, you can read it. I believe that it's public domain now. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it's a book that details not only during the Reformation movement, but persecution even after the first century church, or rather after the first century period of the church. And in that book, you read of many people who went to the death in the name of Jesus Christ. Why were they able to do that? Because they had assurance that regardless of what may have been happened to them physically, that they were protected by God spiritually and they would have a home in heaven. Paul himself said at the very end of his life, I fought the good fight. I finished the faith. He says, I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, but not to me only, but to all who love is appearing. This is not like Paul had some sort of like fatalistic view of life or a nihilistic view of life. This is, this is all meaningless. No, he says, I have hope and you can have it too. If you're a Christian, you can walk through this world knowing that you have hope. I want to look at our final point this morning. Because this is what hope provides us with. Hope helps us to endure. Let's go ahead and read verse 6 through 7. In verse 6 through 7, this is what Paul, or Peter rather, says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. I love what James says in James chapter 1. We've been going through the book of James in our morning class. James opens up his letter in James chapter 1, verse 1 through, th uh, verse one, or excuse me, verse 2 through 4. He says, my brother, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect. I think that's amazing. Knowing, I love that he says that assurance, that you know that no matter what you're going through in this lifetime, you have absolute assurance. But James and neither does Peter here say, you're never going to go through trials. No, Peter even acknowledges. You got to remember why Peter's writing this. He's writing this to those who have been scattered because of persecution. The book of Hebrews, most of the New Testament is written to those who are facing hard persecution. Whether it was under the reign of Domitian, whether it was under the reign of Caligula, whether it was the domain of Nero and so on and so forth, they were facing some hard times. There were many, the book of Hebrews writes of many who were turning back to their former way of living because they were like, man, this Christianity thing, there's a lot that comes with it. And yet, you know what the book of Hebrews and Peter and the writers of the New Testament all are saying? Yeah, but Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And the life that he has for you is far greater. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. I love what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12 and verse 12. He says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in in prayer. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Jesus himself says, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 through 58 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in what? He says, knowing that your labor, all those hardships, all that suffering, all the times that you have just said, I don't know if I can keep pressing forward. He says, if you keep pressing forward, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that's what can keep us helping. That's what, keep, that's what can keep us pressing on. Amen. Paul talks about all the things in his life in Philippians chapter three, but he says, I press on to that upward call. He says, I continue. I want it. I pursue it. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, let us lay aside every weight that tries to entangle us, that tries to ensnare us. He says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ is victorious, right? We don't say Jesus Christ will be victorious. We don't say Jesus Christ was victorious. We say Jesus is victorious, amen? Because we know that because of what he did, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his coming again that we have assurance in, he is victorious. Can you and I say the same thing with him? If you're in Christ and you're living faithfully, you can, but you and I have to endure. 
We have to keep pressing on. We have to follow. Let me tell you, you know who gives up? People who don't have hope. That's who gives up. And if you've thrown in the towel, you've given up something so precious. Let me tell you, I don't know how many years I will have on this earth. I'm, I'm 30 right now. Well, I'm about to be 30 in January. January 1st, in case y'all are thinking about gift ideas. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, you know, I'm turning 30 in, in January. I, I, I've lived... I, when I think about Jesus, Jesus lived to be 33, right? About that, 30 to 33 years. And it's so hard for me to imagine how the greatest being who's ever walked the face of the earth endured this life without sin. And yet that's why he set that life before us, to show us this is how you can do it, to live with him. I've gone through some things in my life. I couldn't imagine people who have gone through things for 60 years, for 50 years, longer. There are some people who've experienced things in their first 15 years of their life that I could never fathom. But you want me to tell you something? None of it is greater than heaven. There's no suffering that you will ever go through that could ever compare to the peace everlasting that God will provide for you. There is no suffering or no pain that you can ever go through on this planet that can compare with what God has laid up for you. Amen? That's what Paul says. Let me tell you, if you're in Christ, you have that hope, you have that assurance. I read a story not too long ago of... uh, in 2009, two individuals, uh, this, uh, I guess they were a husband and wife, they snuck into a White House benefit dinner. I thought that was really interesting. I don't know how you get by security doing that. They did. They breezed right through security. They basically just lied, bluffed their way in. They were taking photos with celebrities that were there. They took photos. They took photos with Joe Biden. I mean, you know, they, and they weren't on the guest list at all. They weren't. They lied their way in there. Let me tell you, when we think about Christians, us, You and I, when it comes to heaven, if you're living faithfully, you have your name written in the book of life, right? But let me tell you, if you don't have your name written in the book of life, if you're not a Christian, there's no way that you can sneak into heaven. There's no way that you can just get into heaven without God looking. We've got to live faithfully if we're going to see that heavenly kingdom. If you're here this morning, and if you want that hope, like I said earlier, I don't know what every single person in this auditorium has gone through. But do you want to go another day through those things without Christ? Do you want to go another day going through those things without his provision, without his protection, without his love? What's the point in going through 60 years or 30 years of suffering and then not having eternal peace with him? What's the point? Do not leave here today without that hope. Because the only people that are provided that hope are those who are Christians. And if you're a Christian, you're a part of the church. So therefore, the only way you can have that hope is by being a part of Jesus, the church. Apart from that, there is none of that. So if you want that hope and that assurance that Jesus Christ can only provide, remember John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I've got to be a part of Jesus. Because in him is the hope of the world. In him is hope that surpasses all understanding, but apart from him, there is no hope. There's only alienation. There's only darkness. There's only separation. But remember, but God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Peter preached this sermon in Acts chapter two, and he said to them, he's like, look, without Jesus Christ, all of you that are here are without hope. You're hopeless. And you know what they said to him? They said, what should we do? And did Peter say, nothing. There's no hope for you. Did Peter say, I got an idea. Why don't you, you know, you know just say a little prayer in, in, in your seat and that's all you got to do. No, Peter says, let every one of you repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive hope. And if you want that hope, you've got to be a part of the church. But if you are a part of the church, and you're starting to lose sight of that hope, oh man, you gotta widen your eyes, right? You gotta see life for what it truly is. And you gotta take note, man, there's something greater than this. There's something more than this. There's something far more important than work. There's something far more important than, and I I know this is very, not a popular, there's something far more important than our physical families, than our friends. There's something far more important that every single person can enjoy. There's something far more important than ball games. There's something far more important than anything that this life, than a better education. Not to say those things are bad, but there's something more important than those things. And if we lose sight of that, we've missed the point of life. 
Because the point of life is to have that hope and assurance that Jesus Christ can only provide. And if I've missed that, then I've missed my purpose of living. You were designed for something greater. You realize that, right? You were designed for more. And if we limit our lives to just the things on this planet, then that's all we're going to get. And eventually this planet fades away, right? I don't want to fade away with it. I want that assurance that Jesus Christ can provide. If you're lacking that this morning, we encourage you to partake in that as together we stand and as we sing. Thank <laughs> you.